Hello, people of the world watching new vehicle reviews on the internet. Welcome to the, the 2024 Mazda CX-90 Turbo S. Today, I'm gonna get Mazda's new luxury SUV up in the air. We're gonna nerd out in the tech specs, see how it is constructed, and then go put it to the test. I see this has what I like to call the I'm in denial, I'm still powered by an internal combustion engine style muffler. <laughs> Cause like, why is that not included into the design? It looks weird without a tip back here. Stainless steel constructed and made in-house by Mazda. No tow hitch. It is capable of towing 5,000 pounds. You just have to wrap a rope around your gut. The CX-90 utilizes a five-link, multi-link rear suspension with aluminum knuckles, as well as the upper arms. The lowers are steel. They're covered in a bunch of plastic cladding, which not only helps with aerodynamics, but also keeps stones from chipping the finish on the front of this lower link, as well as a Mazda-labeled coilover damper manufactured in Korea. There's no rear anti-sway bar. Wild. Aluminium shields under the rear diff instead of some crappy hairy cardboard or even plastic. Up underneath all that shielding is an all aluminium in construction traditional style longitudinal rear differential. It has a 3.692 final drive ratio. And the reason why they went with that is because Mazda has what they call kinetic posture control. The new Matsuda CX-90 chassis coated KK internally is a traditional longitudinal mounted drivetrain configuration and this Turbo S Premium Plus model weighs in at 4,899 pounds. This thing's got so much plastic underbody cladding. It's literally just a skateboard underneath here. Bunch of heat shielding, can't really see the drivetrain up there or the, in this vicinity, a small battery pack for the hybrid system. Mid pipe diameter, 65 millimeter stainless piping or about two and a half inches SAE. Above my head, there is only one transmission available with the CX-90 and it is an in-house designed 8EC-AT, eight speed planetary gear automatic transmission. However, there is no torque converter. It is a dual wet clutch setup, but because this has an integrated hybrid assist motor, there is a hybrid electric motor on the back half of the engine, then a single wet clutch, then the transmission and another single wet clutch. And under normal conditions, it'll provide 80% of the torque to the rear wheels being rear biased and up to 50% of that torque can be provided to the front wheels when needed for extra traction. Up front, the CX-90 utilizes a double wishbone front suspension configuration constructed out of all aluminum with the exception of half of the lower wishbone. Now my theory on why they utilize two different materials in the construction of the lower wishbone is the same reason why Toyota and Subaru differed on the construction material for the knuckles on the Subaru BRZ and Toyota GR86. One has steel while the other one has aluminum. And that is because aluminum has a lot more rigidity than steel does. Steel allows for some flex, which will change the handling characteristics. So by making the rear half of this lower wishbone out of steel, versus the front being an aluminum, that will change the rigidity of that lower wishbone, which will in fact change the handling characteristics. If you look all the way up here at the top above the upper steel wishbone, you can see the strut towers where the damper is mounted is cast aluminum. It does have a front anti-sway bar and that measures in at thick. 30 millimeter in diameter. It's a little quick access panel, presumably for draining your oil during oil changes. Active grill shutters, but it's strange. There's a, a side mount heat exchanger only on the passenger side. What the hell is this? No, there's a water bottle in there. What? Gross. It's time for the braking test. No one behind me. Ready? Here goes. Okay. Yep. That was pretty good. It started off pretty good. It was aggressive at the first bite, but then the stopping distance kind of got a little bit longer than I thought it was going to. But all in all, it was aggressive and 
pretty solid braking. That braking was just made possible thanks to a little two piston caliper and a 348 millimeter or 13.7 inch front rotor. The wheels are an enormous 21 by nine and a half with a positive 45 millimeter offset wrapped in a 275 45 21 inch Toyo open country all season tire. It's 275s up front on this thing. It's some wide meats. Plastic front inner fender liner, technician friendly ease of access to put this thing on a lift, carpeted upper inner fender liner, but plastic splash shield down here at the bottom in the back. Out back, you get a little single piston floating caliper. However, a larger 350 and a half millimeter or 13.8 inch rear rotor, thanks to the inner parking brake drum, makes everything a little bit bigger diameter. And the wheel and tire, just as wide as you get up front. In the name of science, I will now give this thing the beams. But first, bolstering assessment. <laughs> there is no bolstering. This one's opted with almost white leather seating surfaces. The seats are both heated and ventilated as well as the steering wheel is heated. As far as drive modes go, I got a little flipper down here that says me drive, which I can go from normal to sport, changes the gauge cluster, as well as off-road also changes the gauge cluster. As far as traction control goes, instead of having a little icon, you actually get TCS printed on the button, which defeats your traction control, but not stability control. As far as the shift lever itself goes, it's a rather interesting shape for a knob, but what's even more weird is the fact that it's habit to go straight up to put it into park. However, if you take your foot off the brake, you'll notice you're in reverse. So you have to press it and move it over. I'll give this thing a little assistance and let it eat. Ready? Go. Delay. There we go, torque. Synthetic noises, it doesn't need it. That's good. It's quick, but it doesn't need the fake sounds though. It's a straight six. I don't know why they added those. It's quick. It's, it's definitely quick. Transmission is confused at times though on what it wants to do. Hood pop. Hood struts. Underneath the head of the 2024 Mazda CX-90 is the eSkyActiv G 3.3 liter all aluminum turbocharged straight six that produces 340 horsepower from 5,000 to 6,000 RPM and 369 pound-feet of torque from 2,000 to 4,500 RPM. Now that is in conjunction with the mild hybrid system that on its own produces 16.6 .6 horsepower at 900 RPM and 113 pound-feet of torque at 200 RPM. Let's get a look at this engine. Lift this guy up. That's quite the cover. Too bad there oh, what is this? Ah, someone at Mazda was using their noggin. And I think that probably just, Yep. So oh, here I was feeling like a genius and there's literally a picture showing how to use it. Another little plastic cover right here, but you can see the water to air charge cooler right on the side of the engine. This is a little inlet for the coolant. It's got its own expansion chamber. Ah, oh, that's what that side heat exchanger is for. It would have to have its own heat exchanger if it's got its own divorce coolant expansion chamber. Neat. You can see the turb ski mod right here on the side of the engine. It's got an integrated manifold. It's strange the way they routed that. The downpipe is facing forward. You can see the O2 sensor right there. Does this lift up? Oh, it does. <sighs> or it just comes off. Now they utilize the plastic valve cover as common. Plastic charge pipe that helps with heat soak quite a bit going across the top of the engine right there. I'll clip that back into its place. Oh, those are rubber. That's kind of nice. The irony of the warning saying it'll be hot right here, yet it's made out of plastic. The engine itself is fairly compact. Everything is right here in the center. It's not a spaghetti mess of crap going everywhere, but because of the slope of the windshield, quite a bit of it is tucked up underneath that wiper cowl. Now, not to scare you and sound like one of those hypochondriac mechanics that think all technology is bad, but this does have a rear timing chain. And yes, that is going to be a little bit difficult for ease of maintenance, especially with the design configuration of this engine bay. You're more likely to have to do a rear main seal than you are a timing chain on a modern engine, unless of course it's an Audi 4.2 liter V8. Now, it wouldn't be a Mazda Sky Active engine without an impressively high compression ratio, especially for forced induction. This one is 12.0 to one with an 80 
96 by 94.2 millimeter bore and stroke. It does have sequential continuous variable valve timing on both intake and exhaust. And also that turbo runs at a peak of 19 PSI. And if you put crap grade gasoline in here, it'll drop the horsepower output down to 319 to keep this thing from knocking itself to death. But the torque output remains the same. I'm not doing a full-blown off-road review because this thing's got 21-inch wheels and I don't feel like destroying these wheels on rocks out here. But what I am gonna do is the hill climb test because I need to see how Mazda's all-wheel drive system works in this and if it's capable of climbing this hill that makes many transverse configured crossovers fail. I like that it at least has trail cams in a dedicated off-road mode, but when it's in off-road mode, the tachometer needle looks like a cigarette butt. That's <laughs> so weird. Not doing anything to tire pressures and I'm going a very slow run up, but it did rain recently, so it might help some of its traction. Traction control is on right now. No, okay. So I'm gonna defeat traction control and try that again, because I think it actually might climb this. Very slow run up, because I don't want to hit the bumper. All right. Yeah, get it, Mazda. No problem. Pretty good. Pretty good off-road capabilities. All right. Now I do have a hill descent control. Let's see how it works. It's set at two miles per hour. It's smooth and quiet. You don't hear the robotic whales making noises like you do in some of the Toyota Lexus products. In case you don't know what robotic whales are, those that's what ABS sounds like. Ooh, it sounds like someone chewing on a rubber band. This is not an off-road test. We will do this gravel pit and see how it handles it. Off-road mode. Trail cams are up, love that. No, I, I get zero detection of this struggling whatsoever. I can only imagine how good this would be off-road with some proper tires on it because it's doing phenomenal even on these tires. Superb. Oh yeah, side note, you wanna see something weird? Listen to the blinker. It sounds like someone chewing on a frozen walnut, like an ice cream. Does this recline? Oh, it does. This is a snazzy back seat. I have my own rear climate control, ventilated and heatilated. USB-Cs. I got my own little center console, a little butterfly door storage compartment. What is this? Whoa, you could put cassette tapes. Cassette tapes would fit perfectly in there or pop charts. Okay, super comfy third row. I got plenty of headroom back here. As far as leg room goes though, let's see. I mean, that right there is with the seat slid forward. Four cup holders, yeah, there's only two seats back here. The USB-C charger, little speaker in the D pillar. Can I fit over here though with the seat all the way back? Ooh, barely. My feet don't fit though. There's still enough room to put a, like nine boxes of cat litter behind you. <laughs> Cats poop a lot. Automatic. There's actually more room behind this third row in here than there was in the Toyota Sequoia. That's a much bigger vehicle. AC power inverter, a cigarette lighter, a little strap. What is underneath here? Oh, it's a little plastic storage tray area and a tool kit. Absolutely, hands down, one of the reasons why I would choose this over one of its competitors is for the interior. It is absolutely gorgeous in here and different, unique with the type of materials they use. Power fold mirrors. I'm usually not a fan of wood grain, but this is super pretty, as is this material down here. It's like a cork almost. Tiny little airbag in the center of the steering wheel. Cup holder, little split compartment, USB-Cs. The infotainment screen is fairly low profile, but yet it's nice and wide. It blends in nicely with the dash. It might look like a number 
floating in the desert, but that's a heads up display. The infotainment controls themselves are fairly idiot proof. You have quick access for navigation, music, home, back, and favorites. The infotainment system itself is stereotypical Mazda. It's a very basic looking main menu. There is, however, a ton of customizability in the menu system. For instance, like this, paddle shift logic. You can actually customize how you want the paddle shifters to behave. I've never seen this on a vehicle before and I love that it has this option. One complaint, I did notice the antenna is not very strong for the satellite radio if it's super cloudy out. That is not the shape of a CX-90 and it has a rather long front end. Is that an Easter egg for a future vehicle coming? You really notice the handling characteristics of this on a lower speed, tighter road or pulling out of somewhere like going on a 90 degree angle, you can fear that, feel that rear bias of the SN wanting to be a little bit playful, but also that massive amount of grip just clawing along in the front with those wide front wheels. As far as the hybrid system goes, it's more of a power adder without ruining fuel economy than it is something just purely to enhance fuel economy. That sentence didn't make much sense, but in my head, it definitely did. Some of you might have gotten it. Also, the hybrid system, one thing to point out, the inverter is on top of the transmission. So that's an interesting location for it. And the lithium ion battery pack, with Mazda being so focused on weight distribution, I'm surprised they stuck it under the driver's seat, which is always guaranteed to have somebody sitting in it. You think they would have put it over there on the passenger side of their best friend's ride, trying to holler at me. I don't want, sorry. It is now time to give this thing some scores. Starting with the bean score, the assessment of feeling you get your gut when you give it the beans. And the Turbo S model of the new CX-90 gets a rating of, followed by the cookie score. And this one, as fully loaded and equipped at just over $60,000, gets a rating of, Next is the wrench score, the assessment of ease of maintenance. And again, ease of maintenance is all relative to your skill and education level as a technician. But this is getting a rating of... Next is the squid score, the assessment of handling, and it's getting a rating of... Ah, it was kind of an off-road review, so I'll give it a meat mall score also. And it gets a rating of... And lastly is the Penguin score, the assessment on how much I personally like a vehicle. And CX-90 gets a rating of... This thing gives me strong millennia 929 vibes with the level of innovation and creativity in this vehicle, where most manufacturers are just making cookie cutter RC cars for the next couple of years. They came out with a brand new straight six. That's cool in my book, and it gives this thing a lot of character. So, hope you guys enjoy this review. I'll see you soon with another. Bye!